share a little bit of my understanding, some of the knowledge that I've kind of accumulated around the area of the Scottish ballads. I want to open some doors. I want to suggest some things. Some of these things might be wonderful and you can take them forward. And I apologize to previous students who might have heard some of this before. Um, uh, but some of the things I'm saying are really for your information and your knowledge. Light a spark somewhere to take something forward in the classroom, then I'll be very, I'll be very happy indeed. Okay, but some of it you think, oh, I can't do that with our kids at school. Totally uh, legitimate. I wanted to thank Ronnie, Dr. Ronnie, um, for the kind invitation to come and speak this afternoon. I'm really pleased to be here. So, definitely not a good start. That was working earlier, so let me just try that again. Problem with my plonker, my doofer this week. I think might be on its best legs. Oh, there we go. So it's a wee bit temperamental. What is a ballad? Well, Kurt Wittig, in his famous 1958 big sort of panoramic study of Scottish literature, tradition of Scottish literature, quoted a guy called Gordon Hall Gerald, whose key text the Ballad of Tradition appeared in 1932. And this is what uh, Gerald said. A ballad is a folk song that tells a story with stress on the crucial situation. It tells it by letting the action unfold itself in event and speech. And it tells it objectively with little comment or intrusion of personal bias. Okay, so you might want to just look at that for a second. A song that tells a story, there's a crucial situation, there's action, there's events, there's speech, and there's a little bit of objectivity. So, work. Okay. There was a lady within the north, her name was Sarah. She was courted by nine noblemen and a plume and lad free arrow. As he get up yon high, high hill and doom yon dancing arrow, twas there he met nine armoured men come to fecht with him on yarrow. Now you are me at all, but there's nine o' you and but ye know me, and it's nae unequal marrow. There's nine o' you and but ye know me, and it's nae unequal marrow. But I will fecht you ye in by ye. We dance, O oh, Yaro. He slew, and three withdrew. Three lay dead, he wounded. But in behind came our brother George and pierced his body through. Now ye'll gang him, my and tell your sister Sarah that her true love John lies dead and gone in the dowy dens o yarrow. As she get out yon high, high hill and doon yon den narrow, she spied her true love, John, a bloody corpse in Yarrow. She washed his face and combed his hair, as aft she'd done the foe. And she washed the red blood frae his wounds with muckle grief and Her hair it was three quarters lang, and the colour it was yellow. 
She's tied it run his middle seat mo and carried him him free yaru. Oh, doctor dear, dry up your tears, dry up your tears, oh sorrow. And I'll give you some prettier man than the lad ye lost on Yaro. Oh, ye tack your seven sons and wed them all tomorrow. But a fairer floor ne'er sprang in June than the lad I lost in Yarrow. Oh, mother dear, you'll mark my bed, you'll mark And there a lie I'll die for the lad I lost in Yaru. Her then did make her bed, she made it soft and narrow. And her tender hair it soon did break. And she died for twas tomorrow. Okay, so better. Be Thank you. Thanks. A wee bit of a gloomy start to the afternoon. Actually, it's probably for it really, but it's a ballad. Either that was the border ballad, the Dowie Dens of Yarrow. Many of you already know. one of the most famous of our Scottish ballads. It's a ballad that's got love, there's landscape and colour, there's riding and fighting, there's mothers and fathers and sons and daughters, and there's a bed saft and narrow. And these things appear in lots. to handle ballads. In fact, the great ballad scholar David Buchan has a things here. When I was a student here at Glasgow, I learned about ballads from the wonderful Douglas. Lucky was I. I didn't realise that I had heard some of these being sung at home because you don't necessarily think of these things when you're a child or a teenager. And I vividly remember one of Douglas's classes on the ballads, where we at one ballad in several different variant versions, and it was really complicated. It was a giant, a very difficult jigsaw puzzle, and it seemed to me as if we were trying to focus on a moving target. And at that point, just that was it. Little did I think, of course, I'd end up working on songs and ballads as my own area of research interest, and I'd be teaching them to undergraduates or speaking to you about them today, because they remain for me awkward. But nowadays, and the more I work, I see their influence in, in elements of our national literature and culture, I find them more and more fascinating and rewarding. And actually, after listening to all our speakers today, um, so far, talking about themes, characters, topics, the ways in which we engage younger learners with Scottish literature in general, I think the ballads are a really good place for pulling a lot of these things together. So I might not have time to articulate all of the points today, but I think you'll see them resonating as I talk with things we've already heard today. Um, and as I said to you, I hope that uh, some of the things I'm going to share you might be able to use uh, in your own teaching practice. If we pause for a wee minute on that, Definition by this this kind of story. Um, I could, for example, give us a sense of the complexity of the term because in the Oxford English Dictionary there are numerous ter numerous definitions for the word ballad. And this is just a, a selection of them. A light, simple song of any kind. Um, well, especially specifically a sentimental or romantic composition typically consisting of two or more verses sung to the same melody. You've just heard that a lot, a lot more than two verses, um, with only, or only with light musical accompaniment. 
or it might just be a popular, usually a narrative song, one celebrating or scurrilously attacking persons or institutions. One of the things I'm not going to talk about specifically today are political ballads. A lot of them are a very good way actually of engaging students and, and pupils with that kind of material. Or we might know the term ballad in jazz and popular music, a solo song, piece of music, spe specifically one with a romantic nature like our power ballad. Um, the, the little comments that the Oxford English Dictionary gives are what makes a ballad a sentimental perfect wedding of words and music as witness White Christmas or, or another one from 2004 try naff soppy ballads sang naff upbeat numbers instead <laughs> so actually even the definition of the word ballad is sometimes a good place to start um, the folk in your class might have an idea of what a ballad is. They've certainly heard something in terms of their popular music listening, which will be ballistic in its content um, or in its essence. And we'll come back to that towards the end of, uh, of what I'm going to say today. The etymology of the word goes right back to the 13th century. It's actually rooted in a French form, a song or lyric poem, usually with three strophes, all ending in the same refrain. Point. I'm going to point some of these things out to you shortly. Quite often used for dancing, singing to, um, and there are numerous iterations of the etymology of that word from the 13th century onwards and across all European nations. Uh, and Scotland is clearly one of them because both our ballad scholar David Buchan, who I've mentioned, and also the great Emily Lyle and her editions out there, their own ballad probably date back to the 13th century too. For example, Sir Patrick Spence, the King Sits in Dunfermline and Toon, is that fabulous first line, it is one of, our, one of our wonderful sea ballads with lots of historic connections to Norway, um, which dates from that period. And of course, one of our... The rhymer it has protagonist Thomas of Exel Dune, who we know dates also to the 13th century. For me, there are many reasons why the ballads are relevant to our learning today. First of all, as I hope I've just demonstrated, the ballads are a multimedia form. So I sang the Dowie Dens to you, so you were listening to the text. I projected the words up so that you could have watched them while you were listening. It's perfectly legitimate to do that. But sometimes for me, that distracts from the experience of to that ballad in performance. Instead, I showed you a Victorian painting by Noel Payton, inspired by the ballad. I might also have shown you the opening pages of an orchestral score for a, a big born Hamish McCunn from about the same time as the painting I showed you. I loved the ballads. Um, and in this sense, I think the ballads are a 360 degree experience. They are literary as text and it's very legitimate to do that. There's lots of useful things we can do with that. But they are created, they are meant to be performed, to, to be experienced as part of a live process. And this orality, so orality with an O and orality with an AU, the attraction to younger learners and uh, getting them into the world of ballads because we live, of course, in a multimedia era. And I think it's, in many ways, I hope I'll show this, it's easy for us to access the ballads now, to open up the history behind them, to facilitate all of that because we live in a digital age ourselves. And there's some really fantastic resources that I'll share with you. So that's one reason. It's a multimedia performance-based form. And I think that's really attractive. Secondly, our ballads are often referring to of so depending where you are in the country, you will doubtless have a ballad or a range of ballads geographic reference. Um, and that includes ballads in the Gaelic language, which I don't sadly have yet, but there are many, many ballads in Gaelic too. As well as locality, ballads often on historical figures or events. So there's a connection here with finding out about your past locally, really and nationally. 
and there may be good opportunities here to work with colleagues. And there's um, valid from a particular area that perhaps has relevance to the school that you work in, looking at hi the history of that ballad alongside the literary response and performances of that ballad. As my friend and colleague Sarah Dunnigan has said in her Scott note, which I'll come back to at the end, um, like the still flourishing genre of political protest song, ballads could be composed within a community to express disquiet or unease. Poetry and music, when combined, enshrine cultural memory and, memory and social solidarity. The historical and they permit us to enter into the shadowlands of the past by rendering it vivid and. Uh, I think that's no. To be on, and thirdly, uh, they consider, they present, and they reflect on human in a multitude. Uh, often the stories of the ballads uh, engage with experiences or social changes, and sometimes they do this by use of the supernatural. And I'm thinking here of that wonderful novel you were talking about, about the Shadowlands, um, earlier on, Maureen. It, they find ways, the ballads find ways of addressing really complicated or difficult situations, illegitimate pregnancy, infanticide, the death of one's children, um, the death of uh, family members who've got, you know, sons who've gone off to war. Um, very often difficult situations for the, for the individual or for the community. And they find w ways of, um, of opening up these and exploring these topics in a kind of slightly, in a, in a slightly different way, in a slightly different way. Fantasy is in there, uh, but very often include selkies, ghosts, fairies, witches, devils, brownies, even the metamorphosis of humans and animals and vice versa. Supernatural forces are part, of course, of our national, our na our national storytelling culture. We know about them through Scottish fairy tales, through short stories by Hogg and others that we've mentioned already today, even in works of longer fiction, and they're very central to the ballad tradition too. So nearly always they're addressing some kind of difficult social or human experience. So if we come back to the Dowie Dens, um, I wanted to just focus on this a little bit to start exploring this idea of, of ballad history. This is a being one of the beautiful glens in the borders, not far from where significant collectors James Hogg and Walter Scott live. We've heard a wee bit about Scott already today. So we might pause and talk a bit about that. But how did a ballad come to be? It's a very good question. Often, we don't have authors of the ballads. Anonymous is a very concept to think about and to explore because the creation of the ballad is very much a community creative process. Uh, most ballads have an oral beginning. In other words, somebody generates the story or the ballad. And in performance, the community listens to that ballad and contributes to it. So I often tell my students when I teach ballads at Glasgow that I could sing that ballad again now or I could sing it all while we had a cup of coffee and it would be an interesting feel. The, the audience would be would be the same, I would be the same, probably sing it exactly the way I just sang it. Um, it would be a different acoustic. We might feel different at that time of the day or night whenever it's performed, okay? And I might forget my words. That's why I had them in front of me. I might forget my words, um, so I might change the order of things that happen in the ballad. Or I might uh, go round the stanza as I get stuck and my memory, my memory you know, loses me on the way. So they're always changing. And somebody else might say, oh, I heard a verse ballad and she goes off down the lane with him and she doesn't come back for two days. And that then gets wound into the ballad. And again, we develop these different kinds of stories around, these storylines all around the same kind of process. Transmits, transmutes and we end up with these multiple variants, okay? So ballads are living texts. Really exciting, actually, to engage with, uh, with, with students. Behind, you can see the wonderful figure of Jeannie Robertson, 
uh, one of our great ballad singers who was captured orally in the 20th century. On the right, you can see the early 19th century print of a street ballad. Aren't they across time? Um, if ballads are living texts, and we pause and look at a printed ballad or we listen to a particular version of one, then we are literally stopping the clock. That's me and my holidays. Stopping the clock. Um, stopping the clock. We are various uh, ballad scholars and ethnomusicologists call it different things. Pin the board, freezing the bird in flight, taking a snapshot of something that just seconds later uh, will be a different picture altogether. Okay? So that's an interesting thing too, stopping something and thinking about it just in that moment. It's not a text that maybe is going to be the same forever. Uh, is quite an interesting thing to think about. Ballad form is very simple. is the quatrain or a four-line stanza. You can see that there. This is the beginning of the Dowie Dens that I sang, which is one of, one of the child versions. Um, it's most often used in the naming scheme. Here it's an A, B, uh, A, B, A, B, C, B here, isn't it? It can be A, A, B, B. It can be you know, any combination, really, of, of, of that particular format. Repetition is really important. So in the Dowie Dens, Yara appears something like 50 times. <laughs> Uh, if, and, and actually you would think, oh, this is really poor. Do you know, if you got that from a, stu from a student and that was a piece of creative writing, you would say, right, come on, come on now. You're having me on, you're, you're using that, you know, that word far too often. But as you can see in performance of the ballad, it's incredibly powerful that that is the constant refrain of that ballad. Okay, every stanza in that word, okay? Sometimes it can be an eight-line stanza with a refrain. Sometimes you can tag on a little two-line chorus. At so they engage in performing the ballad with you. And you'll hear lots of you can hear that online. So this is a form, a poetic form, that is really easily replicated. So a challenge can be, right, let's, let's us write a Let's see what we can do. What, what would the subject of the ballad be? We're going to write it in a four-line. What rhyming scheme are we going to have? What kinds of images would we like to include? We can play here with similes and metaphors and all those things that you're banging your heads with uh, trying to get students to, to engage with or to understand these literary concepts. Colours can be used important in the ballads. Numbers are very important in the ballads. We'll see a wee suggestion of that them as part of uh, the Dowie Dens. Okay? There's, there is definitely a creative task in there. You might have somebody in the class who's a bit of a singer. A bit of a singer and might on, on singing something or creating a tune or choosing a tune that you maybe work with. You can clearly see here that, um, that of the ballad to follow through um, and show you how the ballad transforms even just in our printed culture. Okay, so this is, we'll come to the performance, performance of this ballad shortly. Dating is really hard to do. This is, uh, on this slide, this is the version of the Dowie Dens, and I'm aware it's not great. Grainy. It appears in Walter Scott's, it doesn't start the same way as the ballad I sang. Late a teen, drinking the wine, and ere they paid the lawn in, they set a combat then between to fight it in the dawning. So it's looking at the, the battle, the, the fight with the nine, the nine courtiers and, and, uh, and our hero, um, that, that actually I go straight into the, I, the ballad I sang went straight into that moment in the action. Okay? But you'll see later on, it's page 75, page 77, you'll see at the top, four is hurt and five is slain on the bloody braze of Yarrow till that stubborn knight came him behind and ran his body thorough. Okay, so it's the same story, it's just uh, represented in a slightly different way involved in this particular ballad. Okay, and that story and bits of that story will then appear in later versions. So we could swap then when American folklorist Francis James Child, and we should all bow our heads when we speak, when we speak of the ballads, when we do child, we stop. When 
English and Scottish popular ballads in multiple volumes. He included the Dowie Dens with some of that information that Walter Scott had included many decades before. But he, rather than choosing one version of the ballad that he hears, actually includes 16 versions of the ballad. Okay, so as an undergraduate, this is where I said, I'm out, I'm out. Um, and around the same time as him, as child, our Scottish ballad collectors, Gavin Gregg and the Reverend James Bruce Duncan of Lynn Turk, who has the best title of anyone I'm mentioning today, collect an amazing body of ballads in Scotland, ballads and songs, a, a new edition of which was completed eventually in two, and there's eight volumes, something like 2,000 songs in this collection. Okay. Fantastic online resources about the Greg collection. Um, and you can see numerous ballads from the Northeast. You can even click on them to find out which ones are around. So if you're in that part of the looking for something to tackle with your class in terms of ballads, there's bound to be some North um, which can be a wee bit rough and ready and uh, might not be totally appropriate. Uh, it's up to you to decide. Um, you, you can certainly find a lot of them there. So they include versions of the Dens, which clearly was sung at the time, the same time as Child is collecting them. Uh, and later in the 1950s, other versions were recorded by this man here, Hamish Henderson, who left behind really one of the richest, richest, I mean, one of the greatest gifts to our nation that anybody can have left. All of these folk are making significant cultural contributions to Scotland by collecting this material and making it available. And in their own time, they're in the media, the media for the, by the time we get to Hamish Henderson, you can see him with his recording kit. Um, prior to him, recordings would have been on wax cylinder. Uh, but, but Hamish was where we're getting towards, you know, decent, decent uh, tech, decent tech by the time we get to the 1950s. And uh, basically his collection gathers a whole load of traditional singers, travellers, traditional singers who are performing these songs as they from generation to generation. So many of the recordings of artists that, uh, or singers, um, I mean, I, I think they're artists, but... Uh, uh, singers that Hamish Henderson heard are people who would not have learnt they would have learnt them orally from generation to generation. The really exciting things nowadays is that a lot of those recordings are available to us online through this amazing resource um, or the Kist of Riches and this has fantastic, I don't know if anybody knows, does anybody already know this? Yeah, great. So there's some of you, you have already used it. This is amazing because you hear the ballads from the horse's mouth, okay? If, and I did search for the ones in here, there are 52 recordings of the Dowie Dens or ballads related to that story on this resource alone, okay? Um, and that's from the recordings by singers like David recorded in the 1950s, Ewan McCall's famous recording, most of these child ballads can be found in amazing recordings by Ewan McCall, all through to Betsy White in the late 1980s. It's a great resource to work with, okay, and there's some stories, some other things on there, you get the tunes, you get the background, and you get more information about some of these amazing singers, many of whom are women. Okay, I'm going to come back to women later. Uh, and I even found, not on that resource, but on working on the Dowie Dens, uh, a, a really lovely 1964 recording of this by Joni Mitchell. Really young Joni Mitchell in Yorkville on the 21st of October 1964, and she introduces it as an old Scottish thing called Yara. And she makes a lot of at the end of every verse. In the ballad, The Great Selkie of Sul Skiri, a ballad from which human form turns into a seal, a ballad deeply rooted in Indian culture about love and loss, replayed many times in children's storybooks, in plays, in the writing of George Mackay Brown, both in his story, The Island of the Women, and also in the ballad of the Lady O. 
Center, which is part of the ballad singer right at the middle of his Orkney tapestry, which is a really great, I would love to have a reenactment chapter of the Orkney tapestry because it would make a, a wonderful uh, a wonderful theatrical event but uh, that song would make a great that ballad would make a really good case but I want to stay in the borders um, for the other ballad I'm going to talk about um, to finishing off with some examples some ideas that I have and some examples that might be useful and Tam Lin is the ballad I'm interested in it's a ballad and I'm interested in it particularly I'll come clean with you because one of our final year students is doing her dissertation on Tamlin and I'm supervising it. Um, and I'm using passion and enthusiasm actually as a reason to raise it with you today. I don't know how many of you know this of Tamlin or the ballad of Tamlin, a few probably do. Um, but the ballad features a really feisty young woman called Janet who defies her not at Carter Hall, but she goes anyway. And she meets the attractive figure of Tamlin and she falls in love with him. And in most versions of the ballad, she then realises that she's pregnant with his child. Go into the green wood, unless that's what you want, I think is the answer. Whether Tam is in love with her or whether he's just manipulating her for his own end is up to us to decide. The rub of the matter is that Tam is in fact enchanted. He's under a fairy spell, his horse in and he's in the fairy world as a result of the fairy queen's glamoury, as it's called in the fairy world. He's enchanted by her. He's worried that after his seven years stay in fairyland, he'll be facing a life in hell. And he knows he's going to his mortal state. Janet is willing to help him. And she must do this by waiting in the Greenwood at midnight on Halloween when the fairy troop will ride through the forest. She knows which horse he's going to be on because he describes it to her. She must grab hold of him through his metamorphosis in horrible things, on right of slide, including a red hot poker. I'm not quite sure about, I mean, we can maybe talk about time. And animal forms such as a serpent, a bear, a lion. They're, they vary depending on which version of the ballad you're looking at. And of the ballad. It's one of the only, in fact, I think it is the only ballad that Burns actually handles. Burns likes, writes all these and plays around with all these hundreds of songs. Tamlin is the only ballad version of, uh, by Burns that we have. But when he, he turns iron and she has to throw water in order to turn him back into the mortal Tam. She will then cover him in a green coat. Green is very important as a colour in this ballad. Okay. It, colour of fertility as well. She will cover him in a green coat and he will triumph, become mortal, and she will gain the father of her son, of her child rather, oh, being presumptuous there. I don't know what it is she has. So it's a child. Um, it's love of this bad and her wish to work on she's an American student, and she wants to work on this ballad in the context of female agency in the figure of Janet. Okay, and she feels this has much to tell us in current times. Okay, body note. Neither of them are Scottish. Uh, the first is Dean's novel, Tam Lin. Uh, and in this version, Janet is a college student, and Carter Hall is Carter Hall, a university where her father teaches. and the book is set. The other, Fire and Hemlock, by the well-known British children's author Diana Wynne-Jones, and her story tells, uh, or her version of Tamlin, and her relationship with Thomas Lynn, heavily by uh, Wynne-Jones' own readings of both Tam Lynn and the other fairy border ballad about Thomas the Rhymer, Wynne-Jones weaves a tale of a Polly and this girl called Laurel. Realizes that she really is in love with Thomas. But in the end, 
It's Polly's own discovery of these two extant Scottish ballads of Tamlin and Thomas the Rhymer that brings her to the point of realising that Laurel is in fact the Queen of the Fates, with whom Thomas has entered into a pact. She manages consequently to outwit Laurel and there's a happy ending to the novel. So I'm interested to find this research and to see where our further and deeper study of but it's a ballad like the Dowie Dens and many others that has had lots of impact in other areas of our culture. There's currently a Kelpie's illustrated tale for younger readers on, uh, on Tamlin. And of course, there's Liz Lochhead's wonderful poem, Tamlin, from her 1981 collection, Grim Sisters, which is a little modern take on uh, the situation that she finds herself in. This brings me on to the last bit. Women's role as carriers of traditional Ballads is notable. Early contributors like Anna Brown or Anna Gordon, uh, who helped Walter Scott, or James Hogg's mother, Margaret Laidlaw, who also sang ballads for Scott to put down. Women are persistent, if often in the background, to these male collectors and editors of ballads like I mentioned today. And it's notable here that women are very much part of this moment. So I've often thought that Katie Tunstall's song, The Big Black Horse and the Cherry Tree, is really a modern day ballad. And a closer inspection makes me even more convinced. So she says herself of this song, Black Horse and the Cherry Tree is inspired by old blues, Nashville psycho hilly hillbillies, and hazy memories. It tells the story of finding yourself lost on your path and a choice has to be made. It's about gambling, fate, listening to your heart, and having the strength to fight the darkness that's always willing to carry you off. Okay, so again, we could pause on any of these ballads I've talked about and raise some of those issues. They're very timeless issues. And there's the first verse and the chorus of Black Horse and the Cherry Tree. So you can see, if you actually just take a wee deep dive into it, that it's an eight line, it's an octave, it's got woo-hoo, woo-hoo, okay. Um, it's got a lovely little rhyming scheme, talking, walking, tree, me, and then it has a lovely join in refrain at the end, okay. So it's actually a ballad. It's really a modern ballad, okay. And this will be a song that our listeners might prefer to start with before they go back and listen to the old 1950s traditional singer um, sing a ballad in a really, um, a really autistic way in that sense. Somebody went about um, the angel share and some of the language in it. One of the other slides, and I removed it, and now I'm sorry I did, uh, was a slide about a documentary with, it was Aidan Moffat, former frontman of, Adam Strap, uh, of, of Arab Strap, who goes to meet and spends time with the ballad singer, Ella Stewart. And he's trying to sing these older songs and update them and put them in his own language in his own moment. And she is violently against it. And the two of them have this wonderful respect. He told me about this because he'd watched it as part of his anthropology course. Um, and it's full of really, really bad language. So I, I had it up and then I thought, no, nah, I think that's maybe not really appropriate for school. But actually, it, it is a really watch because it brings a modern day artist with that older generation of traditional ballad singer. And it visits a lot of songs, including a song like in Time, which actually we sing in a public nowadays and which all our kids know, all our kids know. And they certainly, if they don't know it, their, their grands know it or their parents know it. Or, so there's a lovely familial connection with that song. Leave that slide in now. Anyway, anyway there we go. The who I, who I hugely admire for her handling of ballads is Corrine Polwart. She recorded the beautiful Dowie Dens of Yarrow eh, on this album, Fairest Fleur, but her, wind, her A Pocket Full of Wind Resistance, this wonderful one-woman show that she created um, just in, in, in 2016 and toured, really beautiful meditation on motherhood, on nature. It's very, very prevalent to things that are and much discussed and thought about now and it's all weaving together um, existing ballads, traditional ballads. Um, it's a really interesting, perhaps for, for older learners, 
school rather than younger ones, but certainly worthwhile thinking about. The person who advised her was David Gregg, and of course his strange undoing of Prudentia Hart, all based on the ballads. It features ballad characters and its wonderful protagonist, Searcher. Level ones, um, we do uh, wind resistance with our honour students, but there's a lovely way in which you can see ballads making their way still through various elements of our Scottish literary culture. Okay, so I hope I've shown um, some ways in which that you can use some of these resources. I hope I've maybe expanded your knowledge a wee bit just of the Scottish ballads. But I wanted to end by drawing your attention to the existing Scott notes on this, which is by Sarah Dunnigan. It's absolutely wonderful. So if you were wanting to start to do anything in ballads, this is where to, to start. And Sarah, this final paragraph here, I, I just felt she said better really what I've been trying to say. Um, As readers and interpreters of Scottish literature, we're not the original and intended audience of the ballads. Uh, the fact that they've fallen into our hands now between the pages of a book should not cloud the fact that they were primarily created for enjoyment and entertainment within communities historically stretching back to the medieval period and geographically extending from Orkney and Shetland to the north to the borders in the south. Uh, they've travelled beyond Scotland too. This is another element I don't have time to talk about, but one you might be interested in carried by Scottish immigrants to be preserved and also reworked within cultures and communities in America, Canada and elsewhere. American country music, and we've just seen that with Katie Tunstall, has roots in the folk music and storytelling traditions of the Scottish and Irish emigre ballad culture. And in that sense, ballads are always nearer to us than we think. More than that, they're a living tradition. There's something both moving and enriching about our ability to interpret, analyse and to use Jeannie Robertson's words to make live ballads which were once upon a time flourished in the house of the storyteller. Okay, thank you very much for listening.